thanks for that introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about this uh, from a, uh, a dietary uh, perspective, and this has been a, a focus of um, my work and my team's work uh, for about 20 years now. So specifically, um, I'm going to talk about uh, two key salts um, in the body, um, sodium uh, and potassium. And you're probably aware that sodium, um, both of these are vital uh, for life. Sodium is predominantly um, in the fluids around your cells and potassium um, is predominantly um, inside uh, the cells. Um, I want to just consider what is normal consumption uh, levels and normal consumption levels uh, for sodium are actually uh, pretty low and we can get a pretty good idea of what they were during hominid evolution by studying uh, the, the very few unacultured populations that still live around the world. And um, the Anamomo Indians um, in the uh, uh, Amazonian jungle were studied extensively in the mid-1970s. And the observation uh, for the, these Indians was that um, overall they ate a, less than half a gram of sodium uh, a day. And sodium is the, uh, the, the, the salt that you think of when you put salt on your food um, on the table. And sodium salt was scarce for most of hominid evolution. It was only first manufactured about 6,000 years ago and only really produced at scale uh, for just a, a few hundred years. And it obviously has um, flavor effects and preservative effects uh, in regard to food. Um, potassium, by contrast, was highly abundant during the first million years of, uh, of hominid evolution. And again, if we look to the um, the Yanomomo Indian intake was about uh, 10 grams a day. So what I'd like to do now is just compare that to actual consumption um, these days. And first of all, for, for sodium, um, this figure just shows you um, a map of the world, um, an estimated uh, data for about 190 countries. Uh, you can see the red uh, indicating very high levels and the blue and the green uh, lower levels. But over in the bottom left hand corner, you can see that mean global intake is estimated at about four grams a day. So that's not a little bit more than uh, what we evolved on. That's about eight times more um, than what we evolved on. Um, if we look at potassium, don't, don't worry too much about the, the complexity on the slide. This shows um, estimated potassium consumption uh, levels for about 30 countries around the world. The key figure is over on the right hand side and mean intake uh, for the world is estimated at about 2.25 grams a day. So less than a quarter of uh, what we consume during um, evolution. So once again, seriously deranged compared to uh, what we were um, or we, what, what, what we what we grew up on um, as uh, hominids. So what are, what are the effects of this? Well, there's, there's very strong evidence that excess consumption of sodium and also inadequate consumption of potassium are both associated with higher blood pressure levels. And there's also very strong evidence that if you take sodium out of the diet or add potassium into the diet, then that will lower blood pressure. And probably there is also an interaction uh, between the two. The problem is that cutting salt intake, cutting sodium intake is proving very hard. Um, about uh, a decade ago, 194 member states of the United Nations committed to try to reduce sodium intake by 30% by 2025. Uh, the WHO developed uh, what they call the SHAKE package of materials to help governments do that through a series of uh, voluntary and mandatory recommended interventions with a strong policy focus. Uh, a recent report from the WHO released last year indicated very limited uptake of these recommendations. Uh, no country was anticipated to achieve the 30% reduction target. And in fact, most were anticipated to receive to achieve no reduction uh, at all. It's proved similarly difficult to increase um, dietary potassium, which mostly comes from fresh fruits and vegetables. And as I think you would be aware, the trend in dietary patterns is towards more packaged and processed food, which tends to have the potassium leached out of it uh, during the manufacturing processes. However, while cutting sodium intake is proving very hard, switching salt consumption looks to be feasible. And this is where I'm going to focus um, in regard to what I'm going to tell you about 
uh, a trial that we did um, of uh, salt substitutes or potassium enriched salts. And these are products that can be used as a like for like switch uh, for regular table salt um, or regular salt used in, in food manufacturing. Um, but what they've got is some of the sodium chloride in regular salt replaced with uh, potassium chloride. And we've known for many years um, that these products uh, lower blood pressure very effectively. There's lots of randomized trials showing that. And we also know that they are very well tolerated by users. They taste much the same. They look the same. You can use them the same when you cook. They're available um, in more than 50 countries around the world, and they're low cost. They are two to three times more expensive than regular salt because potassium chloride is not produced at the same scale and is uh, more expensive uh, for manufacturers to land, but they remain a very low cost uh, commodity. The key problem is that most people haven't heard of them or just don't know about them. So we sought to rectify this by generating some really high quality, large scale evidence about what these products would do, not just to blood pressure, but to clinical outcomes. And we did this project called the Salt Substitute and Stroke Study, which we finished uh, in uh, late 2021. So it was a very large scale. We included 21,000 people in 600 villages. We did it with colleagues in China. And we basically split the villages at random into 300 with about 10 and a half thousand people. They received um, a supply of potassium enriched salt for five years. The other villages just continued to use their regular salt. We followed them up every six months to record um, key outcome events strokes were the primary outcome, but we also recorded heart attacks and total major cardiovascular events as a composite and also the risk of death. So the study went um, very well. Um, there, were, there were challenges to doing it, as you can imagine, something of that scale, but we managed to follow up people for a, on average four and three quarter years. Um, the potassium enriched salt reduced blood pressure um, as we expected it would by about three millimeters systolic. And we had very good follow-up for fatal events and non-fatal events because all of the participants uh, were engaged in a rural health insurance scheme, which enabled us to access uh, outcome data. And the other key observation that I'll just make at this point is that five years into the study, more than 90% of the people who we provided with the potassium enriched salt were still using it i.e. indicating that it is really very well tolerated and something that people can incorporate uh, into their diet. So this next slide just shows the, the primary outcome, which was stroke. Um, overall, there were 3,000 strokes recorded um, uh, during the study. This was an older population with a history, mostly with a history of uh, either high blood pressure or prior cardiovascular disease. Um, and what we showed was that if you use the potassium enriched salt instead of the regular salt, you had a 14% reduction in your risk of having a stroke um, throughout the course of the study. And the p-value there was 0 0.006, which basically indicates we were pretty sure that this was a, a real effect. Um, in terms of the two secondary outcomes that we pre-specified for the study, the first was this major adverse cardiovascular events composite of strokes and heart attacks. Overall, we recorded 5,000 of those events in about 4,500 people. And you can see that we got a 13% reduction in the risk of major, major cardiovascular events. Um, once again, the p-value for that was very small, meaning that we were very confident that this was also um, a real effect. And the same was true for our other secondary outcome, which was total mortality. And we reduced the risk of premature death by... 12% uh, percent once again with a very clear uh, p-value. So the reason that this is so important and why we're so focused on it um, in our organization is the potential health implications of this. So this was a, a modeling study that colleagues did um, for China where, where we did the study. And in China, um, as you know, there's about 1.3 billion people those 1.3 billion people suffer about 10 million strokes and heart attacks each year, and about 4 million of those are fatal. 
if we were to switch China's salt supply from regular salt to potassium enriched salt, we would prevent about 973,000 strokes and heart attacks each year, about 460,000 of which would have been um, fatal uh, events. So really huge potential uh, for benefit through a blood pressure lowering intervention. Now, there is one potential um, downside from uh, using potassium enriched salts, and that's the risk of hyperkalemia or excessively high blood pressure, uh, sorry, blood potassium uh, levels. Um, this is a, a concern really for two sets of, of people, those with serious advanced kidney disease um, who can't manage um, potassium in the diet as, as well as people with regular renal function, and also people who are using medicines that otherwise raise uh, blood uh, potassium levels. Now, in the large study we did, we were very focused on this. We looked explicitly for cases of hyperkalemia, um, although we didn't measure blood potassium levels in every person on a regular basis because it was a very pragmatic trial. We looked for clinical admissions uh, for hyperkalemia, and we saw very few of them overall, and we saw no excess of them in um, patients assigned to the potassium-enriched salt. And indeed, no other um, study has ever demonstrated any such risk, but it is a theoretical risk. And if you were to feed people with serious kidney disease with a lot of potassium-enriched salt, um, it is likely that you would get an increased risk of hyperkalemia. So um, what that means for us in terms of our implementation strategy, and we do have an ambition to change the world's salt supply, uh, which I'll come to in a, in a moment. Um, our short-term focus is on patients with hypertension. And, and the reason for that is that it reflects most of the evidence base. The risk of hyperkalemia can be ameliorated really completely because we would be relying on clinicians who would know not to give, not to recommend potassium enriched salt to those subsets who would be at risk. Um, and therefore, both clinicians and patients are likely to be supportive. And it's a very large target population. There's about 1.2, 1.3 billion people worldwide with hypertension. In the medium term, however, we do want to consider population-wide switching, and we will continue to build uh, the research agenda for that. Um, and we will also target population-wide intervention where feasible. For example, in countries like the UK, uh, where there is a very strong healthcare system, it's unlikely that most people uh, that with serious kidney disease would not be aware of their diagnosis and receive advice uh, to avoid these sorts of pro products. There will, of course, be some people. Um, so in, in terms of the practicalities of how we're going to go about that, um, we want to see global guideline updates um, around the use and the recommendation of potassium and rich salts in people with hypertension. We need to do awareness raising campaigns with uh, clinicians, but we also need to increase accessibility for patients and community. And in Australia, for example, we're currently working with one of the major retailers to get them to put an own brand potassium and rich salt on the shelves uh, with an appropriate label that includes both warnings and I think it would be reasonable for it to include a health claim and for it to be marketed at a reasonable price. One of the final key factors that I'll, that I'll mention just before finishing is that obviously the source of dietary sodium uh, is important. And in the UK, uh, most dietary sodium comes from processed and packaged foods. And so if we want to, to get a change, we will need to be targeting um, restaurants and food manufacturers and getting them to switch the salt that they usually make foods out of or with uh, for potassium and rich salt. Uh, for much of the rest of the world, and, and you can see it shaded in black here, most of the dietary sodium uh, that they consume comes from salt, so-called discretionary salt that's added when you make foods in the home or when you season foods. And for those people, the key will be changing the, the table salt uh, supply. So just finally, I um, wanted to note that the world's salt supply has already been changed once from salt to iodized salt to prevent iodine deficiency disorders. And this is widely considered to have prevented serious developmental delay for millions, but it has had an unintended consequence, which is to give salt an unwarranted health halo. Um, if we can iodize 
and potassium enriched salt, then we will still prevent developmental delay for millions, but we will also prevent strokes and heart attacks uh, for millions more. And we have a probably rather ambitious 10 to 15 year agenda to try uh, to achieve that. So um, I'll stop there. Thanks um, very much for giving me the opportunity to speak.